Hello and welcome back to Tinker Talks Guns. In 1952, Smith & Wesson was 100 years old, and they celebrated this in a variety of ways, one of which was an introduction to a new revolver in their new series of J-frames. Uh, they had been making the I-frame for a very long time, but it wasn't really up to the task of handling 38 Smith & Wesson. And so they introduced their J-frame to accommodate the larger, more powerful cartridge. In 1952, their, inter their addition to this line was the Centennial, which was a J-frame with a concealed hammer, like their old top brakes, and a grip safety, like their old top brakes. The grip safety didn't last long, but the gun has lasted to this day. And that's, that's a pretty good run. So, uh, the current iterations of this gun include the 642, 6 being their prefix for stainless steel and or silver guns, and the 442, which comes with a black finish, 4 being their designator for a black finish. And it remains the quintessential snubby, and between them, the 442 and 642 as a block, are the best-selling revolvers in America today. And um, we'll go to the tabletop and show you why. The Smith & Wesson Model 642 is quite a compact gun, being 6 and 3 eighths inches long by just under 5 inches high. Um, it's quite lightweight. This one, on my scale, weighs 14 ounces, owing in large part to the alloy frame. And this, the slide, uh, cylinder, doesn't have a slide, the cylinder and other various parts, like the barrel, are stainless steel. And it's simplicity itself to operate. You know, pop it open, fill the holes with cartridges, close it, and it's ready to go. And the extractor floor is quite short, but it does a it does a good job, good enough job of clearing the empties, especially if held upside down. And of course, then you can use a speed loader to load it reasonably quickly with practice. And of course, the slide release in classic Smith & Wesson form just slides forward. And um, the cylinder is stabilized at the front by the standard detent used in pretty much every Smith & Wesson in existence. And other than that, there's really not much to show you because that's kind of the purpose of it is for it to be very simple. The stock neoprene grip gives a good hold, but it would be nicer if it extended up enough to spread the recoil impulse out at the top. Um, with stout 38 loads or plus P's, you're probably not going to do a lot of shooting this gun for pleasure unless you're a masochist. This gun also has the ubiquitous and much hated lock. Uh, doesn't bother me, never been a problem. And um, the factory neoprene grips I find suboptimal. They do provide a good grip, they do allow clearance to use speed loaders, but I find the neoprene tends to snag and grab at light cover garments like a shirt or a windbreaker. Which, for a revolver whose whole existence is predicated upon concealed carry, that is suboptimal. The front sight is reasonably good. It's a serrated ramp, which, as you can see, I have painted blaze orange. The rear sight, it's a simple trough in frame sight. And it's very shallow and really not as wide as it should be. It does not really encourage a precise sight picture. Uh, these guns are quite accurate, but they're difficult to shoot well because of the short sight radius and the double action only trigger. Speaking of the trigger, it's not what you'd call light, but on an older gun like this where it's had time to be worked in, it's very smooth. It's very easy to keep the gun stable while pulling the trigger, and you can attain surprisingly accurate shots at surprising distances, um, despite the crappy rear sight. This gun, of course, has a lot of evidence of carry. Came to me from a friend of mine who carried it a lot. 
So, a simple gun with a simple purpose, concealed carry and self-defense. And apparently people think it's still up to the job because, again, best-selling revolvers in America. My acquaintance with Smith & Wesson J-Frames began in the 1980s when I was a police officer. And against the current fashion at the time, I carried a semi-automatic pistol. And my backup pistol was also a semi-automatic pistol. But semi-automatic pistols varied more in those days than they do now. Different safeties, different mechanisms, different operations, single action, double action, whatever. Um, and it was pointed out that in an emergency, I could hand a J-Frame Smith & Wesson to any cop in America, and he'd know exactly what to do with it. So, I got a Model 36 Chief Special, had the hammer bobbed, and had a trigger job done by Tim Mackis, and stuck with that for quite a few years. And it served me well. And that is the big advantage of a revolver. The manual of arms is very simple and very easy to master. The downside is they hold not nearly as many shots as a semi-automatic pistol. In trade for that, you get that simple manual of arms and qualified immunity to jamming. Revolvers do not jam often. If you get a bad round, the primer doesn't go off, pull the trigger and probably the next one will. But revolvers do jam, rarely, but they do. And when they jam, they jam hard. If you're in a fight and your revolver jams, you now have a paperweight or, at best, a blunt object. Because you're not going to clear it during the course of the fight. Still, these remain popular. Now, they're not as popular as modern options. The subcompact semi-autos of today, which hold usually twice as many rounds as this or more, and yet are no larger or heavier, and are easier to fire accurately, because they don't have the double action trigger pull. Those are typically going to be a superior choice, especially for novices, because a snub nose 38 will do the job, but they're not easy to shoot well, especially under stress. So it's going to take somebody with some experience and some training to really, really be adequately armed with a gun like this. Five shots of 38 Special properly applied will stop even the most determined attacker. Properly applied, you have to hit the stuff they can't keep functioning without. Typically, that means a headshot. Take out the central nervous system but it can do the job. And nowadays, your average police officer wouldn't know what to do with this any more than he would any other gun. So, you know, the field is opened up and something like a subcombat striker fired nine millimeter would probably be a better choice as a backup weapon for a police officer. But civilians are in a rather different situation. When civilians are robbed, when they need to defend themselves, <clears throat> typically their attacker is not looking for a gunfight and desperately doesn't want to be in one. There's strong anecdotal evidence that simply displaying a gun averts most lethal force situations for civilians. And this is quite adequate in size to get the point across. Also, we tend to see a lot, and I've watched hundreds, perhaps thousands of self-defense shootings on, you know, security camera video and things like that. And when a criminal in the attempt to rob people or whatever gets shot, the typical reaction is what we call FIBS, which stands for fuck, I've been shot. <laughs> and when FIBS kicks in, they most often bolt, just try to get the hell out of there. In somewhat fewer cases, either they or their body just gives up and says, nope, we're not doing this. 
if I'm not moving, maybe he'll stop shooting me. And they just either consciously or automatically, unconsciously surrender. If they don't, if you're well trained enough, you've got five chances to stop them hard. And even from a 1.875 inch barrel, there are 38 special loads that will accomplish the task. So, now I've mentioned that these are the most popular best-selling revolvers in America. That does not mean they are the most popular self-defense pistols by a very large margin. Um, gun store owners, salesmen that I'm acquainted with, tell me that they sell anywhere from 6 to 14 semi-automatic pistols for every revolver they sell. For better, for ill, revolvers are being marginalized in the current self-defense scene. Time marches on, things change. Anyway, if you like the video, please, please click like because that really helps with my numbers. It gets the video seen by more people. Something about algorithms and YouTube and chicken bones and grass skirts, I don't know. Um, also, if you like the content, subscribe and you'll see a lot more of it. And if you're really motivated, consider clicking the link below and supporting me on Patreon. A buck a month goes a long way when enough people contribute. Anyway, I hope this finds you well. Stay safe, take care, and we'll talk to you again real soon.